I'm all in on uh, Scott Sapicki, and he joins us next on the Murphy Show on Super Talk 99.7 WTN. We'll talk about education in the state of Tennessee and the possibilities of the special session. That is on the way. It's 1222 on Super Talk. Download the TuneIn app so you can take WTN with you wherever you go. I don't know if you heard hot. Uh, yeah, it is hot. Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Always appreciate hearing from you. 615-737-9986, either via telephone. That's the telephone number. 615-737-WWTN if you want to you know, figure out what letters correspond to what numbers. Or you can uh, super text us at 615-737-9986. If you don't have time to call or sit on the phone, if you have a question or a comment for Representative Scott Sapicki particularly, uh, he is invested in your child's education and education all across the state of Tennessee. He's also invested in protecting our Second Amendment rights, and he's a good friend of the show, and we always appreciate having him on, and we'll discuss both of these matters in the next few minutes. Hey, Scott, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. And it's uh, it's uh, summertime. Hayes in the barn, right? Uh, Hayes in the field still. What? Oh, we got a lot of it. <laughs> a lot of it. <laughs> okay. We probably got close to about another 150, 200 acres to cut. I'm uh, I'm fascinated about this experience from afar. I never want to see another hayfield working it in my life, but, you know. Well, I, I know you're working on your weight, right? I am. You could come down and you could uh, pick up hay bales in the in, square bales in the field and stack them in the barn. I guarantee you'll lose some weight. If you get, What's that pay if, an hour? If you give me a little tractor time, I'll do it. I will pay you three times what I make here. Oh, oh. Well, Zin, take that headless bell. Ouch. You co- you come at the Sabiki bull, you get the horns, pal. So uh, it's the end Do of July. Do not taunt. Happy yeah, fun don't ball. Taunt, don't taunt Sabiki. He'll come after you. <laughs> so uh, like, I hesitate to talk about the special session first, but we've only got three minutes, and I think we can do it in three minutes. <laughs> uh, and we can talk about education on the other side of the uh, news break. But um the session's coming. Yes. Uh, the, the governor is all in on it. I, I, I'm i trying to be fair to the governor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that some of the news outlets are being a little unfair to the governor in as much as they're saying, you know, how much support does the governor's plan have? But every time I talk to the governor, they say, or the governor's office, they say, we don't have a specific plan. Now, I don't know if something has changed since I last spoke to them. They just want the con- they want to see if there's anything that we can do. I'm trying to give the benefit of the doubt here. What about you? Well, I, I think what the governor's trying to do is uh, stir the conversation about about gun safety, about mental health, and then let the uh, general assembly take over from there and try to figure out how we're going to steer this to make Tennessee a safer and, uh, and a better place. Uh, I think there's a lot of consensus in the general assembly about addressing mental health issues, addressing mental health facilities, making sure people have proper access when they when they're trying to seek help. Um, You know, we've all talked about the red flag laws or extreme orders of protection. I do not think there's any, well, there is some support, but not enough to make much of a difference in the General Assembly. Um, I think that we can look at what's happening in Memphis right now with the crime, uh, stiffening the penalties for committing crimes. I mean, Matt, if you're a criminal, there's no bill I have to stop you from committing crime. You're a criminal. You're going to commit crimes. So what we have to make sure is we make it as painful as possible to those criminals that want to commit those crimes where they think twice. Is there anything that the General Assembly can do? We've heard that, especially in Nashville and in Memphis, that the local DAs, elected positions, are softer than we would like for them to be. I, I think I can speak for you in that in, in that regard. Mm-hmm. Is there any role for the General Assembly? Well, I think there is. I think, first of all, you know, you have um, A.G. Scarmetti, who's going to be working with those DAs down down in those in those. Try to harden some of those areas and and, but develop a little bit better relationship with them about the intentions of the General Assembly, about where we're going. Right. Um, You know, this mayoral election coming up that you got here in Nashville is huge because, you know, I, I live down in Murray County and we have crime, but we don't have the crime you have up here in Nashville. And we need a mayor that's going to make sure that they draw the line in the sand and let the police do what the police are supposed to do. Yes. Now, we know there are bad apples in in every bunch, right? And let the police weed those those personnel out and take appropriate action when they violate someone's rights or they violate the law. But we have to take a stand to protect Nashville and Nashvillians to make sure that they have an environment that they can feel free to walk the streets in and not worry about it. Whatever comes out of the special session, do you sitting here today, Representative Sapicki, believe that any legislation has a shot at passing the General Assembly involving the temporary removal of Second Amendment rights, solely Second Amendment rights, 
for the purpose of mental evaluation, commonly referred to as red flag laws of order protection. Uh, a flat no. No chance. So the question then is, where do we go from there? And it mm-hmm. kind of circles back to your original comment, more mental health related mm-hmm. issues and that sort of thing. Well, let, let's attack this on the front end, right? Uh, let's, attra- let, let's attack the problems we've had in our, in our school systems when these kids came back from the COVID and we sent them home for a year. Let, mm-hmm. let, let's address, you know, individuals. We see less people communicating face-to-face now and more through Twitter and Facebook, these impersonal ways to, to communicate where you don't have to share emotion too much. Mm-hmm. And I think we've got to get back to a society where people start to talk more and, and hear each other go back and forth. Uh, I try to make sure that they're my colleagues across the aisle that I have dialogue with them. Now, am I going to agree with what they say? Probably not. But at least I can hear them and find it, figure out where they're coming from. As long as they're not yelling at you through a bullhorn, right? Well, they can yell at me all you it's want. It's a little bit of a different, a difficult conversation well, to I, have. I've heard a lot worse on the football and baseball field. Well, I imagine you have. 1231, Super Talk 99.7 WTN. We'll talk the matter of education and security within our schools coming up in a moment with Representative Scott Sapicki. That's next. This report is sponsored by GiveMeTheVin.com. The money's good and the bids are high. Speedy, fast. The check is on Bank of America. WTN coming up today. We'll talk with Holly Lamar. She has an incredible story involving the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency. We'll talk about that in the one o'clock hour. Two o'clock hour, Attorney General of the state of Alabama, uh, Steve Marshall. This interesting case that's made national news regarding Carly Russell and what to do. There was a question as to whether or not Carly Russell would be prosecuted, whether she would be charged with a false report to a police officer or lying to a police officer. Well, she has been charged with those things. If you missed the story, uh, we brought it up last week, just a week before last, I guess, uh, reported a baby on the side of the road and she went missing for two days and then came back and claimed she had been abducted. None of that was true. It was all a hoax. We will speak with Steve Marshall about the aftermath of that and why it's not a quote-unquote victimless crime in the 2 o'clock hour. Right now, Representative Scott Sapicki is with us um, talking about education in the in the state of Tennessee generally and specifically in relation to the special session that's to come sometime in August. Uh, school security. Here in Davidson County, where we sit, uh, the decision makers, primarily Adrian Battle, I would assume, and she's now been joined by Police Chief John Drake in, in saying that they will not be able to uh, place SROs in elementary schools. They claim that they're not against it, at least John Drake did, uh, but they say that they don't have the staffing resources. Now, this ba- this is a little confusing because they have a, a year uh, to place the 70 uh, SROs that it would take. They have $5.25 million sitting on the table from the State General Assembly, and yet they say, well, we can't do it. Uh, Representative Scott Sapicki is with us. Obviously, you're invested in education. Uh, it has been your primary focus since I've known you uh, in the General Assembly. You you are also, like many other of your colleagues, very concerned about school safety. What do you say about this Davidson County situation? Well, we're very troubled uh, by those remarks that Adrian Battle made. I think Chief Br- Chief Drake is kind of in a bad spot here. When we wrote the legislation, you had to have an, a memorandum of understanding between the schools and the police. And if that's not signed, Chief Drake cannot put those SRO officers in the school. Mm-hmm. And so he's kind of behind the eight ball here. And I think he might be falling on the sword here for, for Miss Battle. I think we're going to have uh, in the special session, we're going to ask the speaker if we can open up the education committees and call uh, uh, Miss Battle before the education committee so she can ex- explain her stance on why they don't even want to try, try to find those officers. And I did some research, Matt. I believe they graduated last year from their police academies in eight academies or six academies, one to two, over 170 officers. Right now, current year to date, they've already got over 70 officers going through their through their uh, through their academy right now. So, you know, with the money being supplied by the state, with the security issues that we have on our most vulnerable mat, our our children in our elementary schools, why in the world wouldn't Metro Nashville step up to the plate? and try their best to put officers in these schools. I've spoken to as many mayoral candidates that were willing to come on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, many were uh, of all political stripes. Freddie O'Connell came on. Heidi Campbell came on. Uh, mm-hmm. Senator Heidi Campbell. And Senator Heidi Campbell said something interesting, and I want you to comment on it. She said that she supported the decision of Adrian Battle because she did not believe in militarizing our schools. I think she's misinformed on that right there. Uh, being one of the chairman of education, 
we take school safety very seriously. And, um, you know, when we passed a school safety bill with the hundreds of millions of dollars available for the ballistic tape, for cameras, for door locks, uh, making sure that we have everything in place to protect our schools, we're not, we're not militarizing them. We're providing a safe environment for our teachers and our students to learn in. That's the job. What fascinated me, not only the correlation between the United States military and our police officers, which is a different subject, but also both Heidi and Freddie, and I'm not trying to mischaracterize this. You can go listen on the podcast and and hear it for yourself. The indication that I got was that they agreed with Dr. Battle that the presence of a police officer in a school system would be seen by the children as a negative. Mm -hmm. And to me, I'm like, well, if that's true, maybe that's true. Maybe a lot of these children are being taught in their homes that cops are bad or whatever. Well, then we need to fight to correct that perception. And one of the ways to do that is for a child to be around a police officer that's there as a friend and as someone who's there to protect them on a regular basis so that they can see them in a positive light as opposed to whatever perception they might have. That is 100 percent correct, because if these kids are growing up in these inner city neighborhoods and they're being they see the police doing their job, right? Uh, arresting drug traffickers, sex trafficking, arresting people committing crimes, they could have a negative connotation there. So let's, like you said, let's put that in a positive stance. Let's let them see a police officer that cares about them, that asks about them, that 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 makes sure that they're safe and talks to them. I see, and you know, I've traveled all over the state to talk, going to schools, and to see these young children interacting with these SRO officers is exactly what we envision, somebody that these kids run to and ask for protection. And that's what the police want to do. They want to be there to protect these kids. And I, 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 I'm telling you, Matt, I'm gonna, this one's going to stick in my crawl with this Metro Nashville, especially when we have one of the representatives uh, from, from Nashville who didn't vote for the school safety bill, Mr. Well, Jones. Well, and, and these folks, they, they claim that they want to do anything and everything. I had the conversation with Heidi. I had the conversation with Freddie O'Connell, both running for mayor. And they said, we want to do everything. Why won't you guys consider everything, put everything on the table? And I said, I will consider everything. And uh, 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 up until the time that it becomes an unconstitutional act on your part, mm-hmm. I'm open for discussions. But they won't consider this. It's it's a fascinating look inside the, the mind of someone who thinks maybe a little left of center that they claim to be open to any and every idea that might potentially save children until you talk about the basic concept of putting a security person, a trained police officer in the school system, and they're, oh, that's a step too far. Well, we do our best to provide local uh, control, right? We do our best to do that at the state. But when you're talking about the safety of a child with a administration there at the schools that are unwilling to protect these children because of possibly a political view of the police, I'm sorry, we're not going to stand by at the General Assembly and allow these children to be in danger. We're going to take action to make sure and if the governor wants to wants to act with us, we will work in unison to craft legislation to make sure that we get SROs in these schools. Does it frustrate you that you know that we will not have the full scope of information reflecting on a Covenant school shooting at the time that you're going to be asked to make some of these decisions about mental health? It's very troubling to me. Um, it's not only the manifesto and the toxicology report, Matt. It's testimony from experts, from criminals, or, or from uh, law enforcement, right? Mm-hmm from psychologists, from the medical professionals. What was the state of mind of this individual? How did they get into that state of mind? And then how can we craft legislation to pr- protect our schools and prevent this on the front end? Without, without those, two, those two reports and the testimony, I'm going into this blind. And we can have conversations all we want about what we're trying to solve, but until you show me exactly what the situation was that, 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 that presented itself, we are guessing at legislation. I'll tell you this, I've been there five years, Matt, You've been here a lot longer in politics. When we start guessing, bad things it's happen. bad news. Well, and, and I feel for the families, and you, you feel like you have to say it, that they're acting out of such an emotional place that I can't possibly imagine, especially those that lost loved ones, but even the extended covenant family. But someone, I mean, and, and hopefully someone will, has to step in and and ride above the emotional appeal and talk about why the country works the way that we do. And the only way that we work the way that we do is through open government. 
when government gets involved, government doesn't get to do things in secret. Mm -hmm. That's by, been my premise all along, is that it's impossible. You know, the police don't get to do things in secret. Secondarily, the General Assembly can't do their job if they're being shielded from the information as well. That's correct. And I think transparency is the key here. Maybe, maybe something good could come about this, where if we get the information before us, that we could craft legislation that may save lives in the future. I would hate to pass laws that in the special session that don't address the problem that we're guessing at, and then we have another problem. Let's, um, I tell you what, I want to shift attention slightly and, and slide over to just education more broadly, because there was a lot of consternation. Uh, and you were on our show, and I remember you were trying to be a voice of, listen, I mean, th- this is not the end-all, be-all. Everybody's not getting retained in the third grade because there were some figures that were being thrown out at the time, and there were parents that were very concerned and frustrated. I get all of those things. But uh, now that the waters have settled a little bit, what is your assessment of the, the third grade? Re- I mean, it's called the retire. What do you want to call intervention. it? Intervention. Intervention, the third grade intervention legislation. What's your assessment of it? Well, I think our, our teachers have proven that they've had a tremendous success with that, with that, whole, uh, that whole bill on literacy. Uh, we sit at a 40% literacy rate in our third grade readers right now. Now, it's not acceptable. But we haven't been this high in 17 years, Matt. So we got more third graders right now reading on grade level than we've ever had in the last 17 years. And it's headed trending in the right direction. Our goal is to get to every student, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to start building this step by step. But the numbers we heard when we first came out were 60%, right? 60% of our third graders are going to be retained. And we kept telling everybody that's not true. That's not true. We finally got the final numbers from the department after summer school and all the testing. It's about 1%. And the bulk of those children being retained are at parental request. It functioned just how it was So a- after all of the gnashing of teeth and concern and wringing of hands, the 60% figure went down to 1%. 1%. And I just repeat what you just said. And those of those one percent, you're saying that a lot of those parents are like, "Yes, this is going to be in the best interest of my because my they, son or daughter." Because they spoke with their, they, they spoke with their teachers, they saw the result of summer school, and the teachers convinced the parents that, "Hey, it's it's good for your child to be retained. Let's let's get them caught up." And the ones that did show improvement but still aren't on grade level, they'll be afforded a, a tutor next year to make sure that they get caught up too. Well, and you said at the time, and it it felt like it was falling on deaf ears because everybody wanted to freak out. Right. About the figures they were seeing, not only were the figures improving and I'm not saying that we don't have tremendous issues in public education. I don't think you're saying that either. But um, the figures are, were going in the right direction. Secondarily, there there were these fail safes in place that you've talked about repeatedly that give parents options that don't involve retention. Run run. I mean, I mean, there's there's summer school. Obviously, that was an option. There's summer school. There, there were students that had uh, ed- educational disabilities that were exempt. Uh, family family crisis that were exempt, uh, children with special needs were exempt, um, but we got to the point where we had to have a, a a mechanism that a child who was behind could go to summer school, get the necessary help, and then be able to take a tutor the next year. And I'll tell you this: the teachers in summer school, Matt, that was some outstanding work because we moved a lot of kids in the below category in education. That is the kids that are at least one to two years behind edu- educationally. From the work our teachers have done over these last year and a half, we have the smallest percentage now of children in the below category, which means we are moving the needle in education in Tennessee. Math is next, right? That's correct. We are working with the new commissioner of education and the, and the commission chair. And the uh, uh, Have you met her? I have. Talk to me about the new commissioner. Um, I think you're going to see more of a nuts and bolts type commissioner. She's going to get her hands dirty and get down in the weeds of, of, of what's going on in Tennessee and get it fixed. Uh, she seems very willing to work with the General Assembly on the direction that we have taken education, uh, being more accountable to the fundamentals and the basics of education, which I think is where we need to go early. Um, she's all in on career technical and, and expanding that even more. I know gov- that's been big to Governor Lee, and we've passed a lot of bills with that. But I think what you're going to see is you're going to see someone that understands that we need to rebuild the Department of Education. She will get out into, into, this, into the communities and the schools and have frank conversations with them about about where we're going and about where what we have to do. And I believe she's going to be a great asset we're going to have moving forward uh, to give uh, parents more choice in education in Tennessee. You mentioned to me as you were sitting down, and I frankly had 
forgotten it that we're about to get a sales tax holiday. That's correct. Starts tomorrow. What what what's the deal with this? Tell everybody that might have missed it. So uh, the general assembly a year ago in the budget we passed where we were going to have a one month sales tax holiday on groceries, right? And so it went very well. And we looked at our budget and the finance committee, along with the speakers and the governor, thought that let's expand it to three months. And I think the goal of the General Assembly is as long as our revenues continue to hold with everybody just buying stuff in Tennessee, Mm -hmm. that we're going to keep expanding this to more and more months to maybe we get to the point where there is no sales tax. I don't know how you do it. Well, I mean, we we just do it. You just do it. I mean, well, I I will say that. Look, there's a lot of ways to criticize the General Assembly, but I'm going to set that aside for a moment and say kudos to you guys, because sometimes in our position, we'll yell and scream at you when you deserve it but we don't give you praise when you deserve it. But the idea of a government entity saying, hey, we have enough money to function. What about we give this money back to the people that really earned it? Uh, that, that, you know, I, I just appreciate that. And so you look at your m- numbers and you say we can give, what is it, a three? It's three, a three, three months? Three months now. Wow. And that's, and that's in totality. And I see this question. So, you, I know that uh, when we pay sales taxes, whatever the percentage might be, a portion of that goes to the state and a portion of that goes to the local communities. Mm-hmm. So we're not paying any sales taxes, but the state is kind of reroute. They're reimbursing the local communities so they don't lose local dollars. That's correct. We're going to take state money and make all, all of the cities and counties whole with the sales tax that they, they would be um, uh, doing away with. We're going to come back into them and say, no, 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 you're going to get your money to be able to in your schools and stuff like that. Um. A, a listener on the super text line wanted me to ask you this question. Compare and contrast uh, your conversations with the new education commissioner to <laughs> Penny Schwinn. <laughs> um, that's, well, a, that's a great question. That's, it's, it's a great because it, it's but it's we don't want to speak ill of the dead necessarily. Well, but well, here's what I'll tell you is um, the, the the literacy bill that we are championing right now that other states are copying was with Commissioner Schwinn. Um, everybody knows that Commissioner Schwinn had her short, her shortcomings, like everybody is. Nobody's perfect. Um, I think she got cross with the General Assembly, especially on the well-being child checks that she wanted to do. I, you weren't here for that, were you, Matt? Mm-hmm. Well, the well-being child checks? I was not. No, she, I was not. During COVID, she wanted to implement a, a task force to go and knock on your door and say, I want to have a private conversation with your child and from the Department of Education. Oh, hell no. And that's what happened. That, oh, good Lord, no. And that got her sideways with the General Assembly. Well, yeah. And it was a rocky road after that. I don't need a member of the government coming to my door to tell me that they need to check on my kids. By, no. So our goal with the new commissioner is this, <laughs> is um, to focus on where we started, keep going from there, bring in mathematics, expand career technical, and focus in early education on, on on fundamentals in reading, writing, and arithmetic, and provide summer school and tutoring to the kids who are behind. Scott, it's always good to catch up. Uh, I wish that you did not have to spend a portion of your August uh, in the General Assembly, but maybe some good work will get done there, and, and that's what we're hopeful for. Thank you, and we'll visit with you again soon. My pleasure.